Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to one of our virtual events. We have an exciting speaker today, Professor Michael Walls. He is CTC Fort Hood History Professor, and he's going to be talking today about the Constitution and its founders. So this should be a really amazing topic, and we are very excited to have him. So, Professor Walls, I'm going to go ahead and let you take it away. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the uh, return invite. We are going to talk about the Constitution, but I'm going to do it from a history perspective, not a government perspective, which don't tell any of the government professors, but is way more interesting. So we're going to look at the sort of the historical view of the Constitution, and I want to talk about the people that made it, that framed it, what they were thinking about, what was going on at the time, and then at the end, we'll maybe talk about what that means for us all these years later. Because I think the founding fathers and the framers would probably be pretty. Cindy, you've been muted uh, for some reason. Professor Rawls, we'll give him just a little bit of time to um, get onto uh, his phone while we're waiting for Professor Rawls to get back on. Remember that we have a nature photography program tomorrow at 10 o'clock. It will be, um, uh, there it is. It will be with Professor Andrada. So we're, we've got him back and I will do the sharing. So Lee, okay. you wanna. I don't know what it is, Let's... something about my house. <laughs> but we're hey, back, right? Mr. Walls, can you it. do a, a raise your hand thingies on the here? So I know, no, not literally you, but I need to know which one I need to kick out. The one without the camera. They both have yeah. a camera. Yeah. Oh. So, well, let's take up, let's pick up where we left off. All right, so we're going to be talking about, I can't even figure out how to do that on my phone. I'm sorry. Oh, I, do you need to share? I'll share it for you. No, I was trying to raise my hand for it, but I don't know how to do that. I, I exited out the other one. So anyway, we're going to talk about the Constitution from a historical perspective rather than, again, the government perspective. We're not going to go into the three branches of government and, you know, all the X's and O's of how the thing is, it works. Well, we might hit on that, but I just want to talk about it from a, a past perspective so that we can understand what it means for us now. I think that's really important. There's a lot of talk every year about the constitutionality of this, that, or the other thing. And uh, unfortunately, almost none of us are constitutional scholars, right? I'm just like, none of us, there's a handful of those people in the country uh, and then lawyers and everybody in between, but we all can read the constitution. That's what's great about it. It's pretty simple and straightforward. We can all read it in, I don't know, 15 minutes maybe. And then we can, we can have a pretty good sense of, of what it means and what they mean, what they meant. Now, you know, when you apply it to a, a modern issue, sometimes that gets a little bit difficult. But I thought we would start with just some, I call them fun facts, some weird facts or different facts about the Constitution, because we put the Constitution up there. We put the authors of the Constitution up there on this pedestal. And and I'm not saying we shouldn't necessarily because that they were great. This was a great thing they did. But at the same time, it's it's a lot more complicated than just hey they wrote this document and everybody voted for it and we all love it and we almost worship it because actually none of that happened that way at all. So let's think about a couple of things. If you want to flip to the next slide, 
we have a picture of the uh, it's called the Pennsylvania State House. Uh, the Independence Hall is what it's called. And you can see that it's still there. And you know, surrounded by all these buildings in Philadelphia. And this was this this was essentially as it was back then in the in the 1770s and 80s when it was used. So not only though is this where uh, these 40 odd guys met to draft this thing to create this thing, they actually didn't go into it necessarily with that idea, but they quickly decided they needed to. But this is also where the Continental Congress was meeting in 1775 as they were deciding what to do about the British. No one said independence in 1775, at least not, not out loud, but in 1775, this building is where they appointed George Washington, a you know, barely 40 year old guy, commander in chief of the Continental Army that of course didn't exist. And then he had to go create one. This is the same building where about a year later, those 50 odd men signed the Declaration of Independence, you know, arguably one of the greatest documents ever produced. And then in the 17, you know, all through most, most of the war, not all of it, sometimes they had to, you know, pick up quickly and run away from the place because the British were coming. But this is where they met to do the business of government, such as it was during the war and after the war. So the the original government we had was actually the Articles of Confederation, not the Constitution. It takes going through the war and a number of years and problems later for them to decide that really wasn't working. So Philadelphia is kind of in the middle of the country. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's one of the largest, maybe the largest city at the time. It's historic. So there's a lot of reasons why they're gonna go here and meet here and do that. Probably interesting to some, maybe not others. Uh, anybody out there from Rhode Island? Uh, raise your hand. I know we can't see you, but raise your hand. Uh, Rhode Island decided not to send anybody to this constitutional convention. And here again, a modern person would think, well, why not? This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. This is the greatest form of government there is. And, you know, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. It's not perfect, but it's 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 pretty close. Uh, and Rhode Island was in a state of, of a situation where they were like, no, we don't want a central government. If we have a central government, they'll tell us what to do. We don't want to be told what to do. Uh, they might make us start paying our debts and debt was a real problem uh, right after the war. And so they refused to send anybody to the convention. So there's only 12 states represented here at the convention and they never go. No one, none of the Rhode Islanders sign it. None of them are even in the room. None of them you know, particularly know what's going on. In fact, they won't actually ratify the Constitution for a year after George Washington is the president of the United States. And in fact, the vote is 34 to ratify and 32 against. Well, it didn't matter because it was already in effect, but that kind of gives you a hint. And this is something we'll talk about later that this was not just the no brainer. Again, we tend to think today that why wouldn't they vote for this thing? But the reality is many of the states when they voted either yes or no, the vote was really, really close. So again, even after George Washington was president and Congress was meeting and things had been going for a whole year, Rhode Island still is about 50-50 against ratifying the constitution. That's, that's crazy, it's mind blowing to me and probably any modern person because of how we revere now the Constitution and how we look to it and look back on it as it was. They also didn't just write this in a vacuum and it didn't happen overnight. You know, the Declaration was a document itself that was produced pretty quickly, but a lot of thought and experience had gone into it for you know decades. This document is going to take over three months for them to work out. Uh, about a hundred days actually. And they, they kind of, we call them the framers. These guys are the framers. The ones who are in this room doing all this work are the framers. Uh, the founders, we tend to think of as the ones who were there in 76. Some of those people are the same people, but not many of them. George Washington, of course, was there 
both times, a couple other, a few other people. But they would work from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. I mean, that's not a bad work day, right? But 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., six days a week, they had a break somewhere in the middle uh, for about 10 days. So about 100 days of just, honestly, just arguing and arguing and arguing. You've got, you know, 40 or so, give or take a few, and not everyone was there every day. I think one or two guys were actually there every day probably James Madison, but most people were there a lot of the time. Some people were only there a couple of times and there are some that just never showed up again, shockingly, right? They just decided they didn't want to go or didn't want to bother for whatever reason, but they would work through this. So you think about that picture of the, of the courthouse, it's 1787. There's no AC. It's summertime in Philadelphia. And a lot of the the people that were there will remember it being really hot and sweltering. It really wasn't. It was actually a fairly mild summer, all things considered. But you know, they're all like you see this painting. This painting comes from a nineteen from nineteen forty, but I think it describes them very very well. They're all very formal. George Washington is always formal, by the way. But they're all very formal. They're wearing the you know expensive clothes and all of that stuff, kind of funny looking pants, right? And the hose that no one would wear now. The wigs, some of them. It's hot. They got the windows closed. Uh, the doors are shut. Um, they're trying to keep it a little secret. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So it's hot in there. Tempers are flaring. They're fighting. They don't agree on details, and so they have committee after committee after committee and. Uh, again, most of them were pretty involved, but wow, it was just, it would have just been kind of a grueling experience. And again, today we kind of think back, well, all this was obvious, wasn't it? Well, no, they, they were doing something completely new and completely um, radical. And they, they didn't know what they were doing in, in a sense. This had never been done before in the way that they were doing it. So really why they're there initially is to revise the government situation they already had, which is called the Articles of Confederation. And they were lousy, they were terrible. They didn't work and they were useless. And so they, they realized they've got to make some changes and there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, the economy is depressed, there's debt problems, there's uh, problems on the frontiers with the natives, there's still problems with the British, still problems with the French in Spanish. I mean, there's all sorts of issues. There's problems between the states and they're squabbling over rivers and stuff. And, and it, it, this government is completely unable to do anything. It's actually by design, but in practice, it doesn't work. So they figure out pretty quick that that's not going to happen. And so they decide to have these secret kind of secret meetings. People know they're doing it but they don't want the newspapers or you know people getting hold of it. They don't want the gossip to start. They don't want to scare everybody. I mean, we just went through a war, a declaration of war, a government that again doesn't really work, but it's there. They don't want to go through that again. So Washington retired General George Washington. And keep in mind, this is about 11 years after the end of the, uh, of the, of the, I'm sorry, after we declared independence. It's about five years or so after the end of the war, four or five years. Uh, so it was 11 years after the de declaration. And so George Washington appointed general in that capacity better than anyone else would have, retires back to Mount Vernon. And so here all these years later, they're like, George, we need you. And so they made him the president of this, this committee. So he's the boss, he's in charge. He's making sure everybody gets their turn. The rules are being followed, et cetera. And who else but George Washington could keep all these personalities in check. And there are a lot of very, very strong personalities. That's why they're here. They weren't, they weren't asked to come here by accident. These are people who have ideas, who make things happen, and they uh, will get to it later, but they all kind of agree in principle on certain general things, but in the details, this is where the rub's going to be. So uh, they're having these conversations. Well, one of the guys drops some of the documents and Washington says something like, I must entreat the gentleman to be more careful 
lest our transactions get into the newspapers and disturb the public repose. That's so George Washington, so worried about that kind of thing. And so they did kind of keep it hidden. But the other side of that was they're kind of closed up in the room and it's hot. And again, they're 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 you know sweating and, and angry and probably drinking and all that sort of stuff. So it got pretty wild and crazy in there, maybe a little bit like the Wild West. Uh, also, just another kind of kind of some notes on the Constitution itself before we get to the sort of historicity of it. But of the 39 people that signed it, only two of them will go on to become presidents of the United States. Of course, George Washington will become the first president and James Madison will become the fourth president. And so uh, of all those other people, you would think there might be several that did. Well, just two. And we really, you know, if you think about it in the long history of this nation, we haven't had that many presidents overall, which is somewhat amazing. So only two. Also within this document, the word democracy does not appear once, not ever in the constitution. And a lot of times we talk about democracy, we talk about, especially in modern times, uh, freedom, democracy, we're trying to bring democracy to the world. FDR talked about the arsenal of democracy during World War II, you know, that kind of thing. Woodrow Wilson talked about bringing liberty and democracy to the world uh, as a result of World War I, which of course didn't happen. And so we throw that word around a lot, but the reality is the United States, nor are any of the states actual democracies. They are constitutional republics. In fact, uh, there's a story that tells us that, that Ben Franklin was leaving and by the way, Ben Franklin's in his early 80s, maybe he's 80 or 81 at this point, which is very old for that period of time. He was not in great health. I would assume he kind of napped a lot during these things, uh, but he's still very, very intelligent and very, very with it. And they would carry him in in this sort of chair. These convicts would kind of walk him in and set him down so he could be there. But they were leaving. They, they signed this thing on September 17, which is tomorrow. And September 17 is Constitution Day. 1787 is the, the day they signed it. So we, we commemorate that every, uh, every year at the school. I think most colleges do. We have Constitution Day and a bunch of activities. And so here we are. So on that day, so he's being uh, carried out of the room after himself signing it and so on. And apparently the wife of the mayor of Philadelphia comes to him and, and asks, you know, what, what did we, what do we have? What is this thing going to be? I think a lot of people wanted to know. And he says, a Republic, madam, if you can keep it. Of course, Franklin's known for his way with words and his way to kind of twist things a little bit. And I mean, he's certainly right. A Republic, if you can keep it. And it can be very hard to keep. So the United States is not a democracy. Thank goodness, by the way, if you want to know what a democracy is like, you got two great examples. Remember those uh, student council votes back in high school where it was just a popularity contest and it didn't matter, you know, that the guy running for student president was uh, the dumbest football player on the team. You know, it didn't matter. It was the popularity contest. Uh, or Facebook, right, where everybody likes or doesn't like something, and it's pure democracy. That's pure insanity, if you ask my opinion, and they would have thought very much the same thing, that there's no way that you could do it legitimately. There's no way, one, you could do it, practically speaking, because of technology. It'd be a lot easier today. Everyone could just click and vote, right? But uh, they also thought it just it wouldn't work. It's kind of been tried. It doesn't work. Too many people involved. Too many ignorant people involved. And again, this is how they would have been thinking. And so they, they didn't want that. They realized it was a big problem. So they don't do that. Constitutional Republic. We have representatives that we vote in at our state level, our local level, our state level. And then the state sends representatives to Washington and then they make laws. And again, it's complicated in many ways when, when you actually have to work these things out, but it's, it's kind of a simple concept. So our vote doesn't directly translate into a, a law or a, a thing at the federal level because it just can't. So, again, complicated. We'll get into more of that. After George Washington is president, one of the uh, early things that he did, he, he becomes president in 1789. 
We'll talk about the ratification process in a few minutes. And he declared a national day of Thanksgiving on November 26th. And the reason for the Thanksgiving wasn't to commemorate the, the Puritans or the Mayflower, like we kind of think about it now. It's the same holiday. But it was to celebrate, to commemorate the Constitution, to give thanks, he said, for our new Constitution. And again, here's a guy who knew what it was like to be under British rule, what is it like to run an army who was asked, by the way, to take over the government because it wasn't working and said, no, that would be wrong. And then now is seeing this new this new government take shape. And then he's asked to become the very first president, which we're very fortunate about, too. So here's a guy who knows this thing is good and it's great and it's what we need. I think of anybody, he's probably the best suited to understand this. And Washington really is like, in his own person, the epitome and the representation of what America wants to be uh, in, in like every way. So it's perfect that he sits in that chair first. And so we get a day of celebration, a day of Thanksgiving for the Constitution. So. There were 55 delegates that attended this meeting. Again, not all of them stayed. There were 70 something that were actually asked to go. 19 never went for various reasons. Some couldn't, some refused. I'll talk about a couple of those. 55 were involved in the process. 39 will sign. Uh, some just won't be there that day. Some will refuse. 34 of these guys are lawyers, which might be frightening. Think about it. They're the guys that understand the law and how all that works. Uh, eight of them had signed the Declaration of Independence, which is cool. Eight of those 50 something lived and were here to do that. Um, most of the names you've never heard of. George Washington, in fact, didn't even sign the Declaration. He was out trying to recruit an army. Uh, eight of those, you know, which seems kind of crazy, but some, you know, we'll talk about what happened to some of them. The rest of these guys, they're, they're planters, they're teachers and educators, they're ministers, they're physicians, financiers, judges, merchants. Uh, you know, most of them were landowners of some kind. Most people back then had, if they had a career in town, John, John Adams he, or George Washington, for example, who wasn't here, or John Adams wasn't here. He was a lawyer, but he also had, you know, acres and they had a farm. And you kind of have to divide your time between the two. That was pretty typical of these guys. Uh, most of them held office at, before or after this. Uh, again, two presidents, a bunch of congressmen and governors and other things. But 19 of the ones selected to go just didn't. All right. 39 signed it. Three guys who were really heavily involved, Edmund Randolph, who actually later becomes the first um, attorney general and a governor. Uh, Edmund Randolph, George Mason, both very important and influential figures in Virginia. They said, no, this thing is a bad idea. Which again, shocks, I think, a lot of modern people, modern Americans. They say, this thing is a bad idea. Edmund Randolph eventually changed his mind and he kind of leads the charge in Virginia to pass it. George Mason is going, no, no, no. Uh, Elbridge Gar uh, Gary of Massachusetts is another one who, who is, again, very influential, very important. He refused to sign it. And there were many others who were against it. And the big reason was the original draft does not include a Bill of Rights. So those are amended later to the Constitution because there's so much of this resistance to to this constitution and again we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on so that's the big sticking point so essentially promises were made to go ahead and amend the constitution and build what we now call the bill of rights and that got enough votes but in some cases barely enough votes to pass the constitution so it had to pass in nine states the problem is not all nine states were equal. Some were really tiny, like Connecticut or New Jersey or something. 
Other ones were very large and powerful, like Massachusetts, New York, Virginia. And uh, imagine if, you know, nine or 10 of the states would pass it and then New York says no. Or Virginia says no, and they almost did. I don't know that this thing would have worked at all. Fortunately, they all do say yes, but again, it's very close. So a couple other just kind of funny things or weird things about this. So when they're getting to some of the details, uh, one of the things that gets proposed is, and remember, here's George Washington sitting at the head table. He's got the ha the gavel, right? And he's super dignified. And they're proposing that the army be limited to 5,000 men. And, and you got to understand, these guys are paranoid about standing armies because they saw the British army, you know, terrorize them for decades, right? So they have this mental image of the uh, of a standing army being an arm of tyranny. And I don't think we have that. You know, we live in Fort Hood. I mean, you see these people in their uniforms like all day. There's 50,000 of them here, right? Nobody nobody thinks about it. It's it's actually pretty cool and pretty neat. They would have they would be absolutely crazed if that if they were in this situation. George Washington says, "Well, sure, I'll agree to that proposal as long as we stipulate that anyone who invades us can only bring an army of 3,000 people, <laughs> which is obviously ridiculous. And the people kind of saw that. Now, the reality is we do have a tiny army at this point, and we will for a little while longer, but it won't take long before the, the reality sets in and we have to actually have a real army. Uh, but that's, that's, again, kind of George Washington, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, we're not going to do that. And they listen. And then one more kind of point just about the Constitution and how how maybe different it is than we think. It took until 1841 for us to lose a president while he was in office. So uh, William Henry Harrison was elected our, I think, eighth president in 1840. He gave his speech for like two hours, the longest, most ridiculous uh, presidential speech ever. And he got pneumonia and he died a month later. And no one knows what to do, right? The, the, the article that deals with that, Article 2, Section 6, does say, in the case of the removal of the president from office or his death, resignation or inability to discharge the powers of the duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president. Well, what does that mean in practice, right? It's a theory, what does that mean? Does that mean the vice president becomes the president? Does that mean he's just the acting president? Does that mean we need to have another election to elect a new president? And we'll get into the election process in a bit. You know, they don't know. That's never happened. They never thought about it. They never had to deal with it. And so much of the Constitution is that. They wrote all these things down. They thought about it. They wrestled with it. They fought over it. They argued. They put it on paper. They said, this is what we're going to do. But then when they started doing it, they would go, uh, how does this work? What does this thing mean? What does this sentence mean? And so we start getting different interpretations, right, of how the Constitution should then be applied, which leads us to political parties. That's another thing. There were no political parties when this was written. It was just a bunch of dudes trying to do their best to save the country, protect themselves and their property and their rights, but save the country. And again, a lot of things go into that. But when they actually go to do these things, they don't all work the way they thought. And so they have to start amending the Constitution. So they will. Uh, again, very difficult to do, but they'll have to do it. So, of course, what John Tyler does, and, and John Tyler is kind of a, he's usually at the bottom of the list of presidents, like the good ones, right? He's, he's all the way in the bottom third for sure, maybe, maybe more. He just kind of said, nope, I'm the president. You all have to suck it up. And that's the way it is. And I mean, they did try to get rid of him a couple of times, but that's essentially how it's worked ever since. I mean, it's not until the, I don't know, 1950s that we actually put into the Constitution by an amendment how that process is going to work, right? 
um, I think the 25th Amendment in ni actually 1967, as I peek at my notes here, we did that. We passed an amendment to make sure we had someone in charge. And really that's because of nuclear war and the potential to devastate like the entire leadership. So we had to know who's in charge all the way down the line. Um, but until that point, if someone died and we had a number of assassinations, you know, Lincoln and McKinley and uh, Kennedy and, you know, died, a couple people got sick, um, they had to know what to do. But we just kind of went with it. That's kind of how a lot of times how things work. They just, well, that's what we do. And so that's how things are going to go from then on. Uh, like another thing like that is the two term president. There's not a law in the books until the 19, maybe early 50s and to have a president with limited term. Uh, George Washington, he would have been elected as many times as he run, ran. Uh, he was elected basically unanimously. But he said, no, after eight years, I'm done. And then by tradition, until Franklin Roosevelt, everyone else did that. So Franklin Roosevelt won four elections, kind of a unique circumstance because of the depression, the war. Uh, and then we kind of said, yeah, that's probably a bad idea. We should probably make a rule about that. So we just kind of changed, we changed the constitution and we amended it to make that happen. Same thing with the 25th, the advent of nuclear war forced us to really nail down you know, who's going to be in charge in the event that someone dies or becomes sick, what have you. So, again, sometimes tradition holds a lot of sway, but then in modern times, we've decided tradition's not good enough. We need it hard and fast. So, you know, that's that's kind of the crazy story of John Tyler. He just said, no, nope, I'm the president. You guys have to deal with it. And he was not very popular, you can imagine. So, in general, what we have here before we move on to these other sections is, look, this is a very, very heavily debated document in the formation process. I mean, it's heavily debated now all the time by everyone, right? There were parts that people never liked. This is a, a document that is a compromise, a series of compromises from all these guys that none of them were really completely happy with, I don't think. Again, Ben Franklin, he was asked about it. Again, he's, he, if you want to quote, you go to Ben Franklin, okay? He said, well, there are several parts of the Constitution which I do not present at present approve, but I am not sure I will ever approve them. Well, he signed the Constitution and is a big proponent of everyone passing it. Well, he went on. He says, because I expect no, uh, no better and because I'm not sure that it isn't the best that we can do. So, you know, he is, I think, like most, he liked a lot of it. He didn't like pieces of it. He felt like that was the best we can do. It was super important that they did something, and not just something, but something great. And they did, I think. So here we are, you know, all these, you know, two plus centuries later, we're still using the thing in essentially its form, its original form, with very few changes, relatively speaking. And most of those changes are are small uh, or details like we just talked about who how who becomes the next president or how long you know can they serve not real you know big things there's a few of those too of course so so now let's turn our attention to some of the people themselves who were there so we talked about how we had founders and framers and sometimes those are the same people but sometimes they're different people again founders we typically think of as yeah there we go the picture those guys who were there in 76 and the framers we think of as those guys who were there in 1787 uh, but again some of them are in both places um remember about 11 years had gone by okay five of the original founders there in 76 were captured and tortured by the british during this period that period nine of them were killed in the war so like half of the of the people that were doing the Constitution were at the convention were veterans of the war. Uh, a lot of those guys in 76 were already older uh, or here they were busy doing other things or again, some refused to go right. Rhode Island just simply refused to send anyone. Patrick Henry, who is hugely influential in Virginia, and he's the man most famous for saying, give me liberty or give me death said, I'm not going, 
this is a terrible idea, it's wrong, and to use his words, he's not going because he smelled a rat. And he thought this was the worst possible thing that we could be doing, and he didn't trust it at all. And he will be very, very unhappy when it passes. Thomas Jefferson's not there, which blows my mind that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams also are not present. These are two of the most brilliant people we have. They were the two of the group, along with Franklin and uh, Robert Sherman and one other guy whose name I always forget, who wrote the declaration. These guys are brilliant with the pen. They're really smart thinkers. Uh, Jefferson especially is well known for you know exactly this kind of thing but they weren't there. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is the minister to France. So he's in France doing that stuff and dealing with big international things. John Adams is the minister to Great Britain during this period of time. So he's dealing with, you know, really big important things there, but it just seems like it's kind of a tragedy that these two minds weren't in the room when this was being made. I just wonder, you know, I don't know, would it be better uh, if those guys were able to be there? It's hard to say, but it's kind of crazy that those guys weren't there. Of course, Ben Franklin, again, was there, but almost an invalid. Um, George Washington, of course, is there to head this thing up. So remember, he has the gavel. And honestly, the office of the president of the United States is essentially tailor-made for him to occupy. Because who else, right? I mean, that, that's really the thought, I think, in the room is who else? would do it who else should do it who else can do it and i think all these decades later we are fortunate that it was him because if it was someone else and as great as you know john adams and thomas jefferson and others were they are not suited to be the first president for sure george washington was and is the perfect and only candidate for that so again very you know think about Four, 40 odd, 50 people kind of in this process for a nation of about 4 million. And they were making this massive decision. That's why they send it. So they write it, the 39 guys sign it. And they go, okay, we got a great piece of paper. It looks really cool. They had a professional inscribe it. And then they're gonna, they'll start printing copies. Well, it's still just a piece of paper. They gotta make it legal. And they decide that they will send it to each state. Each state will have its own convention of delegates from every part of the state. Uh, so basically like every county or whatever is gonna be represented at this special delegation. And then they're gonna discuss, hey, are we gonna pass this thing or not? And if nine states out of the 13, keep in mind Rhode Island's not there, so it's nine out of 12. If they say yes, then this thing becomes the law and we start the process to, you know, find our congressmen, find our senators, elect a president, you know, all those things. And, and it's a hugely complicated kind of process, but they have no idea, no idea what they're getting into. And so they do, they, 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 they agree to that. Like I said earlier, though, some of the big states like Virginia and New York, I mean, they were having a tough time uh, arguing about it and they didn't make decisions till late. It, it actually technically passes before those states do their vote, but again, if one of those really powerful states had said, no, I'm not sure this thing will fly, there would have had to have been some other compromises made probably. So what we end up with then are these discussions in the states. And so here we go again, the modern American would go, well, no brainer, they, they finished the document. So surely now everyone reads it and goes, yeah, obviously this is the best thing we, could, we should do. And yet that's not at all how it happened. I mean, it looks like a voting map of every presidential election we've ever seen. It's almost 50-50 if you were to look at it by uh, person to person. It barely makes it. I mean, everyone voted yes eventually, but barely in most cases. So the problem is this thing about the Bill of Rights. That's the big challenge to a lot of people. They say, well, it's, it's not protecting us. So Patrick Henry, George Mason, Samuel Adams, Again, El Eldridge Gary say, no, this is not protecting. This is giving too much power to a, a central government. They're going to become tyrannical and, you know, impose their will on us. And, you know, here we are going, 
yeah, sometimes that happens, right? It's a challenge. Um, and so these guys are saying, we cannot allow this because it doesn't protect us. On the other hand, you got George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and others saying, we need to do this. We have to do this. This is great. This is going to work. This is going to protect you. And and still they'll have this debate. Some of these, some of these, like actually Philadelphia, it happens like overnight and they basically vote unanimous. Might have been some shenanigans going on there. But then again, New York, others, it takes months and months. And again, Rhode Island doesn't even bother to do it until well after it's already happening anyway. It's kind of funny. Sorry, Rhode Islanders. Nobody cares what you think. Just the way it is. Uh, and the small states knew that. And that's one of the things that they debate constantly is how to protect ourselves. That's why we have this bicameral system. Here's where your government teacher can you know, bore you with all the little minor details. But you got a House and a Senate and they have to work together. And there's, you know, two representatives in, in the Senate from each state. And there's multiple representatives in the House based on population and you know, all these sort of complicated little metrics to figure that out. And that sort of spreads out the power and the blame and slows everything down, which I think the framers intentionally made the government inefficient to keep things from moving too fast. So basically, so they had time to pick up their guns and shoot whoever they needed to shoot. That's what I think they did that for and why I think they have that Second Amendment in there. So they are fighting fighting, fighting. Here's just a couple examples. I told you Rhode Island, 34 to 32, four. But again, after the fact, Virginia, 89 to 79. New York, 30 to 27. Three votes, couple votes go the other way. I don't think this thing happens. But again, if you were to sort of peel that back and, and look at Look at like a county map, for example, where each representative came from and their yes, no votes. It would look like a modern red, blue state map when we look at the presidential elections. They're almost always roughly even, right? Whoever wins just barely wins. Even Ronald Reagan, who had the biggest landslide in American history, and Franklin Roosevelt, who's right behind that, only got like 60% of the vote, right? They might have won most of the states. Again, it's because of the funky system we have. The point is, we're, we've always been like that, even on the Constitution, even on this thing that, again, is probably the greatest system ever created so far. So the Bill of Rights is the thing. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. I'm talking way longer than I thought I would, so that's cool. Uh, the Bill of Rights, that's the biggest issue. So. Again, the guys like Ad, Samuel Adams and uh, Patrick Henry, they go, there's nothing in here that protects the citizens and their rights, you know, these things that they called natural rights and that sort of thing. Uh, the things that Jefferson wrote, you know, are life, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which again, part of the genius there is that he didn't define it. He just said it's like these things, assuming there's a whole bunch more. Uh, that'll come into play here in the Bill of Rights too. So there's all these you know, smart guys from that era saying, this doesn't protect us, this is a bad idea. Well, Hamilton and others are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, the government is in this little box. We created the government and we put it in this little box. That's the constitution. So we don't need to put all that stuff in there because it's, it's part of it, it's built into it. But everyone says, no, we need it in writing, you know? And so that's another compromise that's going to be made. Pretty much all of the states went, okay, yeah, we'll do that. Once we get this thing going, there is a process to amend the Constitution. So we'll do it, right? And as soon as we start, we'll do it. And they did. So that'll, again, turn the tide just enough for them to pass. So Hamilton says, you know, the government possesses very explicit powers. Everything else resides with the people of the states. Why do we need to write that in there? So the Bill of Rights was born. We actually put 13 amendments up. We passed 10. Again, I'll let government teachers bore you with that detail about how that process works, you know, how a bill becomes a law, all that, super important. 
but not so much historically, right? So 13 proposed amendments, they go through Congress and the states, the 13 states have to deal with this. And we get the first amendment, the most important one, freedom of speech, press, assembly, petition, and religion, right? The second one, the right to bear arms, which in my, my view is to defend the first one. Uh, the third one is about quartering troops. Remember what I said earlier about how paranoid the founders and framers are about standing armies? They hate the idea, one, it's expensive and they're all like tightwads, but two, they hate the idea that there would be troops everywhere who could then just impose their will like the British did. And what the British would do is they would just take over your house. Hey, we need your house. Uh, that's going to be the colonel's house for the duration of this thing. And so, sorry, uh, we're going to eat all your stuff, all your food, and you have to serve us. And you can go live in the servants' quarters or the slaves' quarters, you know, depending on where you were. And when we're done with it, you can have it back if it's still intact. And that's your duty to the king and to the country. And so the Third Amendment says uh, the U.S. government can't do that ever. The fourth one, a lot of people talk about privacy. This is about search and seizure. You know, the police need a warrant. That's right here in the Fourth Amendment. Uh, it's very, very simple. So, you know, we'll talk about this in a bit. Uh, the Founding Fathers, you know, we talk about original intent. The Founding Fathers never thought about the fact that you'd have a phone with a whole bunch of personal data in your pocket that could be incriminating or not. They never thought about that, right? So, so you know, in the last 20 years, we've had to think about that. What does that mean in terms of the Fourth Amendment, the, the Fifth through Eighth Amendment, which have a lot to do with criminal stuff, so I won't detail those, but it's like right to a trial. The Fifth Amendment, I do not have to incriminate myself, you know, stuff like that. No cruel and unusual punishments. Bail should be set according to the danger, that sort of thing. Uh, and then you get to two really interesting ones, nine basically is there to say so whatever what what's hamilton was saying so whatever we didn't specifically give to the government just kind of stays with the people and then 10 actually says whatever powers we didn't give to the government uh i got that wrong 10 says whatever they didn't give to the government specifically stays with the people or the state nine says whatever other rights that we just we kind of talk about or think about or come up with later those are included in all this, right? So we may not have listed out every natural or human right, but nine says they're gonna be protected here too later when we come up with them. So I hope that made sense. So 10, 10 is kind of the one where your state's rights kind of secession and people go to uh, figure out what's going on. So, you know, that's it, that's the Bill of Rights and that's huge. We probably look to that more than the actual constitution itself, the, the actual original document. And so it's, it's those Bill of Rights that protect you and me from the government and from overreach, at least that's what they're supposed to do. Um, and then since then, that's 10 amendments. There are only 27 on the books completely. There are lots of other ones that have been proposed, but only 27 passed. So that means uh, this, this, since 1791, when these 10 amendments passed, which is what, 230 years? We've only done it 17 more times. And that part of that's because it's hard to do. And part of that's because we usually only do it when there's some big crises happening. Occasionally, they're small. Uh, the 12th Amendment, for example, which happened in, I think, 1803 or four, was about fixing the vote, some voting challenges with the Electoral College. Uh, we actually voted for two people the same amount. And so we had a tie for the presidency and that wasn't intended to happen. Uh, the guy that was intended to be the president, actually 1800s when this happened. So that's why they changed it in 1804 before that election. So Thomas Jefferson gets the same amount of votes as the guy, Aaron Burr, who was supposed to be the vice president and it fouled everything up. And they made a couple other tweaks to the Electoral College. That was a pretty simple one. Boom, boom, boom. It passes. No problem. Then we don't do another one until 1865. Um, and that's, of course, because of the Civil War. So we have small, tiny ones like the 12th, again, changing the Electoral College a little bit, or the 20th, which 
change the date the president and Congress actually start working. It used to be March 3rd or 4th. Now it's January 20th. Kind of a big deal, but it's a little, it's a tiny little tweak, right? Then you get the 13th Amendment, which says we're not doing slavery anymore. And it freed 4 million people and was is a huge deal, right? Or the 16th Amendment, which is everyone's favorite, which said, yeah, the government can tax your income and stuff like that, which, you know, actually we all hate, right? So that's a big change. So we, we kind of get both. And then you get the 18th and what, 22nd, which counteract each other. 18th made alcohol illegal. 21st or 22nd, I forget, you know, then made it legal again because they needed tax money and, well, you know, it didn't work anyway. So you got big ones, you get small ones, but think about that only 17 times since the Bill of Rights was made. So again, part of the genius, they, they let it happen. They made it so you could change it, but they made it just hard enough. So where it was hard, to, it, it just didn't happen that much. So these guys are, they really are thinking ahead to the best of their ability as people who lived in 1787, not, you know, 1987 or 2021. So last thing here, let's, I want, I want to get to, this is my actual favorite part. So I probably shouldn't have spent as much time on the other, but I think all that's important to kind of get to this. What were they thinking? What was going on in their minds and in their lives as they were writing this? Because to a typical college student and, and many, most of us, you know, we work, we're given an assignment. We go make it, we do it, we write it, we turn it in, or we, you know, process it and boom. These guys didn't just wake up one morning and go, hey, uh, let's, let's make a new government. That sounds cool. And no one went to them and said, hey, you guys need to just make a new government and see what happens. It, it's not like that. Um, so, so I want to just back up a little bit. You need to understand that just like you and I are products of our age, our time, all right? I'm, let's just say, almost 50, as my kids like to have told me for the last 10 years. I grew up in a certain time, right? Before there were mobile phones, uh, we did have, you know, color TVs when I was a kid, barely. Uh, before the internet, before computers, you know, all that stuff sort of came along when I was a, a, a teenager. And so, you know, my worldview is very different than those of my children who grew up with this, right? Uh, the world was very different then. You know, global terrorism wasn't a thing so much. There was, it was there, but it wasn't a thing. But I grew up, I was born in the, you know, that toward the end and the height of the Cold War, very different world than today. So I have a different worldview, different life experiences. Uh, you know, and of course, also I grew up in California. Uh, other people grew up in Texas. Other people grew up in New York. So, you know, of course, around the world. So again, very different experiences and whatnot. Well, these guys are the same. They're, they're people who grew up at different times, experienced different things, very different than you and I have experienced. They also grew up sort of at the end, or they may be the beneficiaries of what we call the Enlightenment and the Great Awakening. Two different things, but kind of coincide. The Enlightenment's this much bigger idea about kind of the advent of science and the scientific method, but there's also a great amount of political philosophy. Uh, back then, philosophers were scientists. Like today, we've separated them. Um, but back then they were like mathematicians too. They're mathematicians and they're thinking about politics and they're thinking about humanity and, you know, the stars and all of those guys were philosophers. And over the course through the 16, 17 hundreds, which is, you know, all of our founding fathers pretty much were born in the 1700s, right? The, the mid, mostly the mid early to mid 1700s. So what I want you to kind of get is they grew up and were educated in the style of or the thinking of a lot of these enlightenment thinkers. Okay, so people like Thomas Hobbes, who was uh, really one of the first people to talk about natural rights. So if you kind of remember the declaration, the unalienable rights like life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and you remember the Constitution, which is, and especially the Bill of Rights, which is designed to protect, oh, freedom of speech and so on. Think about what these guys are arguing, you know, 200 years, 150 years earlier. And remember, most of the guys that were in that room went to college, 
and were they knew their you know they knew their uh, Aristotle and Plato and they knew their Cicero and they knew their Thomas Hobb and they knew these guys they read to them. Uh, so he talks about natural rights, that idea that there are rights that human beings have that are not dependent on laws or customs or beliefs or culture or more particularly the government and therefore universal and therefore, in his words, inalienable, which is exactly the term that uh, Jefferson used, right? That's where it comes from. These guys are not making all this stuff up. They're taking it and applying it to their situation in you know the 1750s 60s and 70s which is when this all takes place in 80s uh john locke is another one that they all read uh he talks about how individuals have the right to protect their quote life health liberty or possessions which is something that we all agree with today but back then that was new kind of new thinking for many uh, Montesquieu, a French guy, these other two guys were British, Montesquieu. So this isn't just happening in Britain or France, it's happening all over Europe. And of course, the uh, col colonists are essentially at that point, Europeans still, right? We call them Americans, but but many of them were actually born in Europe. Their parents were born in Europe, uh, same culture. Uh, Montesquieu wrote something called the spirit of laws and he talks about uh, political liberty, the means of preserving political liberty. And he introduces an idea called the separation of powers, which again, your government teacher will talk a lot about in government class. And we have that in our constitution, they have a separation of powers, right? No one person or group can do everything. You can't make a law without both houses of Congress and then the president signing it. And then today, essentially the Supreme Court okaying it. So it takes all of that. Uh, Voltaire is a guy who uh, wrote a lot about tolerance. So that's a, a thread that weaves its way through uh, American colonial history and then later, you know, it's, it's actual history. Rousseau, another Frenchman, he argued against the idea that monarchs are empowered by divine right. Okay, that they're empowered to make law because God's behind them. And these are the kind of things that Thomas Paine and, you know, basically the constitution say thomas paine wrote common sense just just blowing out of the water that idea that monarchs ruled by divine right but again he's steeped in this philosophy that's been around for a couple hundred years um rousseau also said that it's only people only people are sovereign and they are the ones who have the right to make law that's where you get kind of that democratic or Republican idea, right? So you have all of this. There's lots of other ones uh, that you would talk about in your philosophy classes. And we talk about this in my Amer early American history class too, because it, this is how those guys thought. Same way, the way you think is predicated on how history and so on has been taught and how the internet affects you, cable TV, you know, how you get your news, what you've learned, that affects how you think, whether you like it or not, whether you admit it or not. That is the case. So you have that kind of sitting there. So our, our, like our founders and our framers are like the inheritors of all that idea. And then they actually got to take that and do it and apply it and they made it happen. And it's awesome, it's amazing. It's not perfect, but it's amazing. So layered on top of that is this thing that we call the Great Awakening, which is this religious movement in Europe, but really in um, in the American colonies in the 1740s and 50s. So again, you know, two or three decades before the 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 the, the Declaration, right? Well, all of those guys that were there in 76 and in 87, they grew up hearing these preachers, and these guys were famous and they were popular. I know it's hard to believe now, although there's a few, but these guys would George Whitefield is a great example. He would go to a field somewhere and 10,000 people would show up to hear this guy preach. No microphones, no auditorium. It would just be out in a field. Crazy, right? And Whitefield, and there's a bunch of these people, and they, and, and they would come, and they were preaching this gospel that said, essentially, uh, God gave you rights. So kind of taking that 
you know, Hobbes' idea of natural rights and John Locke's ideas and so on. And the Bible says that you have, God says that you have these rights, so they cannot be taken away. And so they would start preaching that, which is okay, highly appealing to your typical American colonists in the 1740s, who keep in mind, by and large, have been left alone to do whatever they wanted for the last hundred years. It's not really until, you know, the 1750s where the British really start kind of getting way, way more involved. And then the French Indian War and especially act between the French Indian War, 1763, and our declaration in 76, the British are just poking the bear every year all the time with these laws and rules. It's crazy. But, but you know, Whitefield has fertile ground and all these others to kind of preach this. It's a it's a less academic kind of preaching and a more broad, emotional, uh, you know, sort of preaching. So your Puritans, their sermons would be, you know, two hours long. They would get printed in the newspaper. Basically, those guys are, real, you know, theology PhDs and they're talking Greek and all this stuff. And it was very, you know, deep Whitefield. He has all that knowledge, too, but it's much more broad. So it has this real great appeal. So essentially, he's saying God gave us certain rights. No king can take them away. And people are already starting at that point to say, hey, you know, Britain's doing too much. They're overstepping. And so now you got politics and religion sort of entwined together, right? Which is actually very, very common um, it, throughout history. And it, it's way more twined together here than people probably want to admit. So again, these guys grew up in that, with that. That's, that's how they, what they were exposed to. And then they, most of them went to college and university. Uh, you know, again, a lot of them were lawyers, they're ministers, ministers, doctors, et cetera. So they grew up in this. They heard this with their own ears. They heard these guys in their churches preaching. They read this stuff when they went to school and they were reading this stuff way before college. School is way different back then. Um, like college was like when you were like 16, you know, 15. And by then you, you probably, if, if you were, you know, at least wealthy-ish, you learned, you already knew Latin and Greek and stuff. We don't do that anymore. It's kind of sad. So, you know, they lived through that. So that's one thing about what's going on. What are they thinking? They live through that. That's how they think. And they don't think the same way that your typical British person thinks you know, from England or Ireland or Scotland. And they certainly don't think the same way the wealthy who actually run the country think. Okay, so that's one spot. The other thing that's really big here, and, and this comes out of the revolution, and it's why the revolution happened and it comes out of that is fear. They are deathly afraid that they will trade one tyranny for another, right? That's why Patrick Henry says, no, I'm not, we're not doing this. That's why so many of those guys were opposed to making a central government that was stronger than the one they had. The one they had was useless, all right? So fear plays a big factor in this, the fear, again, of trading one tyranny for another. So all of them basically agree that government's a necessary evil. All, most of them would say, yeah, the government we have doesn't really work. We need to do something else. I mean, that's why they're there. The ones who went, that's why they're there. Uh, they all agree that they need to continue to protect against some kind of tyrannical situation. So they believed in separation of powers, stuff like that. One of the kind of philosophical underpinnings of this kind of era's philosophy of enlightenment philosophy is that human beings aren't necessarily good or evil. We have the sort of proclivity to both and no one's purely good, right? So when they make a system like a government, you make it assuming that sometimes people are gonna do bad things. So you make the system try to account for that and try to minimize their ability to break it. So again, things like separation of powers, things like uh, having representatives from different places and you know all of that is kind of modeled after that kind of thinking because again they're really afraid that one bad person's gonna blow the whole thing up and it almost happens a couple of times maybe uh fortunately you know we survive right so again they all sort of agree on this stuff and remember they all live for for some of them for decades 
you know, the older ones especially, for decades under the thumb of what they would have called British tyranny, what the British just called everyday life. Why are you bother? Why are you bothering us with your stupid complaints? You're a citizen of the empire. You should do what we say. And the Americans are going, whoa, wait a second. Uh, we don't think it should work that way. So the preaching and the, you know, everything just sort of feeds into that. And the fact that they've had relative freedom for a long time and the fact that they are a little bit wealthier and they're better off than their, say their cousins back home in Britain. So again, they all are there. They all would say no taxation without representation, right? Like that's a huge deal. I mean, if they had cars, everyone would have had a bumper sticker that said that or a t-shirt. But that's like the tip of the iceberg about everything else that's going on. They couldn't agree on what representation meant. They didn't feel like they were represented. So that's why they declared independence. Again, that's that's a, a big root cause. And so now they're like, well, we have to have we have to have representation. We can't, you know, our way. We can't do it that way. So again, that's why we have the Senate and the House of Representatives situated the way they are. Because we got to have representation. That's why we have a census every 10 years. We got to figure those numbers out. Um, so they all agree on that. They all agree that we got to have representation and it's got to be based somehow on population. They all agree and they survive, you know, the British troops just muscling in and British troops were like the police, the customs agents and everything put together. They hated them. The British Navy confiscating all their goods and kind of hindering what they would call free commerce, what the British called black marketeering piracy. Uh, they lived through the Boston Massacre and everything that presented itself from that. That's who's here in this room. And then half of them fought in the war. Washington was the general. That's who lived in this room. And they knew what they didn't want. And they all recognize, again, this Articles of Confederation thing was a joke, right? So, so keep in mind, why do we have it? If it was so bad, why did they have it? Well, one, it just sort of happened, right? They started meeting together in 74, representatives from 13 colonies. They put together this kind of government on the fly. They're going to have equal representation per colony. So 13 colonies, 13 votes. Everything has to be unanimous. Uh, but basically, the government couldn't actually do anything. But they ratified it. That's why they asked Washington to take the government because the government was completely ineffective and they wanted someone who would do it. He said, no, fortunately. So remember, they're afraid of a tyranny. So they made a government that's gonna make sure that no, no other state or person will ever take advantage of that, but it also can't do anything. So that's the problem. So they succeeded too well at protecting the sovereignty of the states and of the people and, and so it couldn't enforce anything. It could suggest, and the states would just say no. Like during the war, they would ask for money, and the states would go, yeah, we don't have any, sorry. You know, stuff like that. And when they were having disputes, the, half the states wouldn't show up to vote. You know, it was a mess. It just didn't work. Uh, they couldn't collect taxes unless all 13 voted yes. And, you know, how often is that going to happen, right? So it was completely a waste. And again, they figured it out. So by the time they're here in Philadelphia in 1787, and they've kind of talked about it for a couple of days, they go, yeah, we need to start over because this doesn't work. But they all agreed, whatever we make has to have, you know, the representation. It has to prevent a kind of tyrannical situation. And, and again, they succeeded. So about five years after the war is over is when they're doing this. So they go five years. There's all kinds of problems, all kinds of turmoil. There's Indian problems, there's debt problems, you know, there's, again, disputes between the states, there's commerce problems, the British really haven't left, and they're supposed to, we don't have an army. I think our army was less than a 1000 people. Once the peace treaty was signed, can you imagine a 1000 less than a 1000 to guard our borders, which were huge, we were already one of the bigger countries in the world at that point. Uh, so it was a real challenge, right? So they knew we got to create a strong government but not too strong. We got to create a government that can do certain things and put them in this box, but not everything and not have a like an open door. And that's kind of the problem today, right? All these years later, it does way more. I would argue some of that probably shouldn't have happened, but I would also argue some of that's because the world has changed and things change. So I think they did it. You know, so again, they didn't just wake up and go, let's make a new government. It's not a homework assignment. This is their entire life. 
that they pour into this document and this new government and and they lived it they experienced it the good the bad and the ugly and they knew what they didn't like and they knew kind of what they wanted at least in principle and they just had a hard time agreeing on the particulars so that's literally what they're fighting over for those 100 days from 10 a.m to 3 p.m how are we going to do this we're not going to talk about that today because i'm already probably way over they all agreed though representation the sort of Republican system, we have a republic, not a democracy. They all agree it's small government with limited powers. Powers like they need to be able to oversee commerce for the whole country, both from abroad and in between the states. Someone has to make those decisions. Common defense, if we get attacked, they need it. someone, one person or whatever needs to be in control to handle disputes between the states. They have to have the ability to raise taxes, right? Which like, they're all going, oh, I hate that, but they all realize it takes money to have a government. And the only way a government's gonna have money is through taxation. Back in those days, before 1913, when that great 16th amendment was passed that we now have an income tax, the government would set its budget. We need a million dollars, I guess probably $5 million that first year. And they would say, Every state's gonna pay according to their population. So every state gets a piece of the pie, depending on how big they are. That's one of the reasons, by the way, they were fighting over counting slaves. Should we, shouldn't we? Virginia's like, we don't wanna count slaves for taxation purposes, right? Because we got like, I don't know, a million slaves. Many of the slaves were in Virginia. But then when they're talking about representation, they're like, yeah, we wanna count all the slaves. <laughs> and so, they fought about it and they said, okay, how about we count three fifths of them? And that's what they agreed on. It wasn't about, you know, a slave was worth three fifths of a person. That's just the number they agreed on, like 60%, somewhere in the middle. Uh, so those kind of things would come up, right? Those like details that as they're going through, they never thought of until they kind of make a decision. Someone goes, oh, wait a minute, what about this? Uh, and so again, they all agree in principle on this. They're arguing about the details. They all agree, as we said earlier, we've got to limit the potential for tyranny. So again, Patrick, Patrick Henry is like, this thing needs to not happen. Others are saying it needs to happen, but we put these protections in there. So that's where we get, again, separation of powers and you know, three branches and they all interact in a particular way or nothing happens. So remember, to them, if nothing happens, they're okay with that because that means no tyranny is happening. Right? So lastly here, what does this all mean? We have a great system, not perfect. A lot of discussion about original intent and there should be, but that only goes so far, right? As I said earlier, they have a set of core beliefs about people in the world, which I believe are still largely true. Uh, you know, things like natural rights, personal responsibility, you know, that sort of thing, public service. These guys were servants, not politicians. That's a, another problem today. They were not professionals. George Washington did it because he had to, not because he really wanted to. Uh, and, and that's how they envisioned it. Well, it's not like that anymore necessarily, right? Um, so original intent's great and important, but it was also 240 you know, years ago, the world was different. Uh, there were no railroads or steamboats in 1787. There was no way to fast travel anywhere. There was no way to communicate over long distances very quickly. Everyone was a farmer basically back then. And of course we had slavery and all that situation too. Cities in America were tiny compared to cities in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Again, Philly maybe had 40,000 people in it at that time when they were doing this it was the biggest city in the country followed probably by boston and new york pretty closely but forty thousand people you know is a, a kind of small city small city in texas right uh interstate commerce you know wasn't really that big of a thing so like that doesn't really become an issue until after the civil war no again no communication so they just couldn't conceive imagine them thinking about telephones let alone the internet, right? Or what we're doing right now, right? This is, this is crazy. 
even though mine never works when on my computer, but always works on my phone, this is crazy to them. So to go to original intent, I get it is important from the standpoint of what were those original fundamental, you know, ideals that they held to, which are, I believe are still true and still there. That's what we want to hold to. But the trick is, and the problem is, and the hard part is, how do we do that today with everything else? It's hard to go back. It's hard to change. So part of their genius was they made it kind of vague. Again, you can read the Constitution in 15 minutes. Uh, so it has to kind of always be interpreted. The problem is well, we're human beings and we don't always interpret it well necessarily. And as our voting maps always say, we're always going to debate and disagree on how it should be interpreted. I mean, that's the genesis of the first political parties. Jefferson said, we got to be very, very strict. Hamilton said, no, it's kind of more loose, you know, gives us more leeway. And so you have these two parties now. Um, well, that same vagueness that is kind of good and cool for interpreting, again, is also a great frustration for so many people because you don't always know what they meant or what they said, even though there's a bunch of other documentation that's around the Constitution uh, and of course, it gets abused by people that want to abuse that same vague stuff. So that's what Jefferson thought Hamilton was doing. He was he thought Hamilton was abusing the clause that said, you know, Congress can do whatever's necessary and proper. And Jefferson goes, well, see, necessary. If it's not necessary, then it can't be done. Ham Hamilton's like, well, you know, it it really just kind of means if it's good. <laughs> and so you can see a very different like tree, right, for how we're going to actually apply all these things. So so that's one thing, right? They kind of made it vague. That's kind of genius. And then again, they created that amendment process, which is also genius, that uh, allows us to act to make real physical changes, not interpretive changes, but actual changes to the actual document, which again, have been very few, two of which cancel each other out. So really, you've only made 16 real changes, some very minor. And that's it. I mean, that's kind of a an hour and 15 minutes basic. I love talking about this stuff. And I have missed lecturing students because of COVID. It's been uh, very difficult. So this has been a lot of fun. So that's it. Uh, I know that there, there's a potential for questions out there, I think, if you want to do that. So fire away if there are some out there. Otherwise, I'm pretty much done. Did they have any questions in the comments? Uh, there weren't any questions, but we did have comments saying they loved the overview. It was very interesting. Those are probably the people I paid, but thank you very much. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Well, I, I just personally have to say that um, I have never understood the Constitution. I've never understood why our, um, our government just seems to sit on each side of an aisle and scream at each other all the time. And now understanding what exactly our, our founders wanted to do was to let us remain totally different than a monarchy and continue to debate and until we all agree on something and then make an amendment which is fascinating i have never never understood that never understood what all the screaming was about until now. And I, I agree with you that it was genius to come up with something that was going to eternally be debatable, but at the same time for the cause of protecting us as a country. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, and it's sort of a blessing and a curse, right? And I think they thought that then, and you know, the Greeks who tried some, and the Romans who tried some form of republic kind of thought, yeah, it's great, but it, it also has major problems. Uh, these guys tried to, they were fully aware of those problems. They tried to delete a lot of them, and I think they did, but still, um, they would never conceive of, I never really did talk about the Electoral College and all that, and that's all on our subject. They never could conceive like that a regular person would be voting for president. They didn't think that regular people had the knowledge base to do that. So that's why they created that system. You know, so again, they today that's foreign to us, and we think, well, that's, you know, racist or whatever, it leaves people out. They were just thinking it's a bad idea. Make, made sense to them. But but the other side is there's always, always going to be disagreement. And But their idea was, well, let's do it in a building and talk about it and, and come to some compromise. The problems are when we don't, when we can't go to war, 
we yell at each other, whatever. It's not pretty. Sometimes people get beat up in there. I mean, it happens. Well, the very fact that we wanted to have a free country and eventually, you know, we were working towards everyone having life, liberty, and the happiness. And it will never be perfect because there's so many different people. I mean, we're all people involved in this. But um, I think the whole idea is fascinating um, that they were able to come up with something that people can do. Yeah. And you just made it so impactful. You know, you were saying you worried about one hour and 15 minutes. Um, you just basically explained everything about the country. So kudos. Thank you well, thank so, you. so much for joining us. We, um, we, you know, we, I know we threw this in kind of late, but I was thrilled when you contacted me and told me that you were going to go ahead and uh, do this because I knew we had the absolute best coming to talk to us today. So thank you. Thank you very much. And guys, I want to remind you that tomorrow we have a nature walk of uh, photography with Professor Julie Andrada at uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow. We usually don't have them on Fridays, but we're gonna do this on Friday and um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. And then starting Monday next week, um, for the two weeks after, we start with our Hispanic Heritage um, series and we have everything from uh, LULAC representatives to cooking and um, poetry slams all in Spanish. We have Little Joe and La Familia, which like, whoa, <laughs> to talk with us. And so we have a lot of fun things that are gonna be happening uh, tomorrow and next week and all the rest of this month. So thank you so much again for joining us. And thank you guys. You guys have an awesome rest of the day. If you happen to be over at the library around four o'clock, our artist is going to be having an art reception and he is from Fort Hood. So, um, very interesting uh, art exhibit that's going to be taking place. So, make sure you come on over around 4 o'clock and um, come take part in that as well. So, thank you guys. You guys have an awesome day. Professor Walls, you are awesome. So, have an awesome day. And I don't go anywhere yet for you, but everybody else, we will see you later. And so, Lee, just take us out.